Peace, friends, and welcome to worship with Edgewood United Church. If this is your first time joining us for worship, we want you to know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I have an important announcement starting next Sunday. Our Sunday worship services will be on Zoom. They will be live at 10 a.m. You are welcome to join us on Zoom. It is so wonderful to see people's faces live, responding, greeting one another, worshiping together. They will also be streamed on YouTube live at 10 a.m. and posted to Facebook, so you can join us that way if you are not comfortable on Zoom. This is a temporary transition as we continue to prepare the sanctuary so that we can live stream from there um, and move into a hybrid worship service from the sanctuary, but also live online for those who are not able to join us in person. That will be coming later this summer. More details as we take in and grapple with the CDC's new recommendations and as we continue to move out of this COVID-19 pandemic. There is good news. There is reconnection on the horizon. So I invite you to join us for the next several weeks on Zoom. Get back into the practice of worshiping with people, you know, being seen at 10 a.m., making it on time for 10 a.m. It is a good practice to reconnect with as we imagine this next season of doing church together with the possibilities of moving towards in person in all the different ways that that means. So for now, let us prepare our hearts and minds as we enter into a time of worship. Let us join together in our call to worship. From comfortable pews, from tricycle seats, from easy chairs in front of TVs, God gathers us in, giving us the words with which to proclaim the gospel. At kitchen sinks, at laptops and blackboards, at nursing stations, Christ calls us to share in serving all creation in communities gathered to pray, in memories of those who served, in families grilling in the backyard. The Holy Spirit fills us with God's joy.
Please join your voice with mine in prayer. We do not notice, holy God, but you give us time so we can think about your word. Silence so it may fill our emptiness. Wisdom so we may know the path to walk. We do not notice, risen Christ, how you have not given just a piece of yourself or a portion of your grace, but all of who you are for us. And yet you regard us as God's amazing gift to you. We do not notice nourishing spirit, how you remove our fears simply by sitting with us and holding our hearts, or how you swirl around us pulling us deeper and deeper into love, grace, and peace until we find ourselves rooted forever in the one who watches over us forever. God in community, holy in one, hear us as we pray as we have been taught. Our creator in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the dominion and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning is Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, your children, your servants of every gender, your animals, or the immigrant who is living with you. 
because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. Six months ago, I was meeting with Edgewood's Governance Council, and we first started talking about my upcoming summer sabbatical. And it is common practice that about every five years of service in a church, a pastor leaves for a time of sabbatical for a few months. So my sabbatical was on the horizon and we were beginning conversations about all the logistics it would involve, all the types of planning and communication it would require of us. Someone on the council spoke up in this conversation and said, whatever we do, I don't want someone to say in July, where's Pastor Liz? Did something happen to her? Why haven't we seen her this summer? It was a very real concern, particularly with the backdrop of the pandemic making communication and connection even more difficult. So you heard it here. If you haven't heard all the other places, next Sunday will be my last Sunday at Edgewood until September 12th. E-notes, emails, and Facebook have been full of the details, information about Reverend Lily, who will be serving Edgewood part-time this summer and leading us in worship on Zoom as the sanctuary is prepared for us to regather, information about the logistics, invitations to connect before I leave, which about 86 of you have taken me up on so far, conversations that have been honestly the highlight and biggest joy producer of my last year. So hopefully by now you've caught the gist of the details, but today I want to talk about the theological and spiritual reasons for this sabbatical. Most of us are familiar with sabbaticals from the academic world, a time away from the classroom to spend a semester deep in research and writing in one's field. But sabbaticals for clergy are a little different. Instead of being rooted in the need to do something else or produce something, they are rooted in the spiritual practice of Sabbath. Sabbath first finds its place in scripture in, in Genesis, Genesis's creation story. That is a mouthful in the Genesis creation story. God spent six days creating the heavens and the earth, the wind and the waters, light and dark, land and seas, plants and fruit trees, the sun and the stars, birds and sea monsters, and every living creature that moves, every creature of every kind, and humans of all genders. God created and crafted and shaped our world, blessing her work, proclaiming it to be good. The story goes on to say that on the seventh day, God finished her work and spent that seventh day resting from all the work that had been done. God blessed this seventh day and made it holy. The early Hebrew people practiced Sabbath as a way of echoing God's rest in the midst of creating. In Exodus, we read that their Sabbath practice became so important to their values and their expression of their spirituality that it became one of the Ten Commandments passed from God to Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you make work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Not you 
or your children or the people who work for you or your animals or any person living in your land shall work. If God could take the time to rest, so can you, because who are we to think our work is more important or urgent than God's work? Okay, that last part might be a little paraphrased. I'm pretty sure that ever since Moses shared that commandment with the Hebrew people, there have been individuals and households and entire communities actively resisting rest, grumbling about rest, or trying to get out of their Sabbath. Humans are, with a few exceptions, a restless people. We have created entire cultures where our worth is defined by our work. Particularly in capitalism, we fear that to stop working, to put down our tasks, to walk away from what someone else is telling us is important, is to become irrelevant or left behind or punished. We are driven by guilt, by the desire to achieve, by the desire to be someone, by the desire to do something meaningful or to produce something. Now, for the most part, these are wonderful human qualities. Look at the advances that we have manifested in our world, the innovations and co-creations we've made that have connected us as people have helped us survive unthinkable global tragedies that have pushed us toward life and new life and new ways of living again and again. Those are all amazing things that are born out of our work. And, and that same restlessness, that same drive, that same determination or unwillingness to take a break is also wrapped up in corruption, in greed, in manipulation of workers, in valuing output over health, in mass burnout as we become more and more addicted to our work. The call to Sabbath is the call to wholeness and balance, to recognize that there is value in both our work and our rest. It is a call to see both as gifts to cultivate, not as competitors, but as complementary practices that strengthen and sustain each other. Surely I know the value and joy of rest after a hard day of work. It often takes work for me to appreciate rest when I experience it. And surely my work benefits from rest. Rest is an act of regeneration and energizing that allows me to go deeper into work when I return. I recently attended a webinar with Trisha Hersey, who is the founder of the NAP Ministry, an organization that examines the liberating power of naps and proclaims rest is resistance. You may have heard me talking about them before. I love the NAP Ministry. Hersey spoke about resting as a, regenerat a generative space. She asks us, what are we missing out on when we don't rest? What are we missing out on when we aren't allowed to slow down enough to gain the knowledge we need? She continued saying that rest isn't the end goal, but instead rest is the tool or vehicle to dismantling systems of oppression. It is this reframe that I find the power in practicing Sabbath. Rest isn't the end goal. But when we allow ourselves to rest, we create space for new ideas. We create space for playfulness. We create space to listen to God's voice and hear what it might be saying to us. Some of my best thinking and dreaming comes in those moments when I am laying in bed waiting for sleep, when my body is still but my mind continues to move. 
When I free myself from the expectation of where my thoughts will go or what they should be focusing on, it is there that I start to imagine new ways of being, where I imagine healing in our communities and in my life. It is there that some of my wildest and best ideas have been born, causing me to reach for the pen and paper that I keep at my bedside so I can capture them. When we rest, we are cultivating space for the unknown. Practice is, practicing Sabbath is the discipline of regular rest, of regular regeneration, of knowing that what comes out of that might allow you to follow God in new ways, or in the case of clergy, allow you to lead God's people in new ways. I believe churches like Edgewood support their clergy taking a season of sabbatical, not because you think we're too tired or too burned out, but because you have faith that in the rest, we will hear how God is calling us and our church to new or renewed ministry and to a new or renewed vision for our future together. Many of you have asked me what I'm doing this summer. And the first answer is always nothing. I'm intentionally leaving my sabbatical as unstructured as possible because I want to create the most space imaginable for God to find me, to dream new dreams, to see where my mind wanders, and to spend entire days and weeks in creativity and play. For me, that will look like writing and reading but also quilting and biking and cooking and snoozing. Time on my patio and time with my loved ones. Walks with my dog that can last as long as our legs carry us. Picking up my ukulele and strumming until calluses form on my fingers. These are the activities that help my mind wander, that open my heart. And this is where I reconnect with the small, still voice inside me that helps me love and lead and serve in the church. It's not only clergy that should practice Sabbath or imagine what a sabbatical season might be like. I know there is deep, deep privilege in working in a place that supports extended time away but Sabbath is a faith practice that each of us should strive to cultivate in our lives. One day a week, or one week a month, or a few hours at a time. How are you intentionally setting apart time for rest and renewal? What are the spaces where your mind wanders and reconnects with your heart? Or where ideas are fostered and God's voice is clearly heard? Tricia Hersey says that rest isn't the end goal, but instead it is the tool or vehicle to dismantling systems of oppression. I'm going to keep repeating that. That means all you folks who are up to your eyeballs in advocacy work and volunteering and saving the world need rest more than any of us. We need you to dream of a different world, one where all people are free. We need you to imagine how we might create justice and peace where there is oppression and war. We need you rested, clear on who you are and how you are called to serve. We need rest, each one of us, at every life stage. The last bit of wisdom that I gleaned from Hersey is that we must understand that no one is going to give you rest. It is our divine right, our human right, that we make space and rest for ourselves. This is a practice that comes from within. It is between you and God. It is up to you to claim it and cultivate it for yourself. This summer, I plan on reading Wayne Muller's classic text, text Sabbath, finding rest, renewal, and delight in our busy lives. I invite you to read it with me as well, 
Think of it as our Together But Apart Summer Book Club. I have been promised that this book will not only teach me about the practice and history of Sabbath, but it will encourage me and inspire me to cultivate it even deeper in my life. I think it might do the same for you too. We'll see if it has enough wisdom to still our restless spirits. And if you would like a book that dives into the more practical, gritty, day-to-day struggle of practicing Sabbath with quite a bit of humor and grace woven in, I recommend the book Sabbath in the Suburbs, A Family's Experiment with Holy Time by Marianne McKibben Dana. It is written by a mom with two young kids who commits to keeping one family Sabbath day a week for a whole year. And it is full of love and insight and honesty about what kind of struggles and creativity a Sabbath practice requires. Even though I don't have kids, I found her story deeply relatable and highly recommend it to anyone. For many of us, a good book is a gateway to rest and activating our imaginations. For others, it might be a movie, an empty page, a garden, a recipe, a pair of running shoes, binoculars, or the presence of a loved one in a day without an agenda. May this be a sabbatical summer for us all, however that looks, finding our way back to God, allowing rest to feed our work, and pausing work long enough to rest. I'd like to end with a poem that was shared in Hersey's webinar. The poem is by Ruth Foreman, and it is called On This Day. On this day, this day without chairs, a day where all the rooms melt together and there are only corners, corners and humming, wishes and slight breeze brushing you like palms. This is a day of prayers, a day of painful breaking, a day of peace beneath, a day of arms, of hands, eyes and quiet windows. I wish you love from your mother backwards. I wish you deep tunnels without fear. I wish you children's laughter. I wish you cactus flowers. I wish you moonlight. I wish you real eyes. I wish you a hand across your back, soft like when you were a child. I wish you tears. I wish you clean. I wish you angels in conference around your bed holding you, so there's no space for me even to touch you. Just watch. I wish your mother watching. I wish you abalone dreams. I wish you peace. I wish you doves in your kitchen, moonlight in your bathroom, candles when your eyes close and dawn when they open. I wish you so many arms across your shoulders, so many lips kissing your ears that you smile from the inconvenience. I wish you all your baby's love attacking the center of your heart, just so you know they are there. I wish you banisters, railings, and arms around your waist, I wish you training wheels. I wish you strong shoes. I wish you water. Oh, I wish you water. Through your feet flowing like a stream. And I wish you hammocks and melon on your eyes, strawberries in your mouth, and fingers in your hand. Fingers in your hand all day, through this house, on this day with no rooms, only corners, and an uncommon breeze. May it be so. Amen.
As we move into a time of prayer, I would like to share with you this prayer inspired by Matthew chapter 11. Here is the invitation from Jesus. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Amen. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. As we leave this time of worship, I look forward to gathering together next Sunday on Zoom, gathering together in a celebration, Pentecost worship, a celebration of the church. It'll be a wonderful service. We will meet Reverend Lily together. And until then, know that no matter where your journey takes you, the grace and peace of God will surely follow. Amen.